close to you Never let me go
causing the life blood to flow freely from his body, only to hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Awkwardly, the soldiers began to lift the cross vertically, moving it into position where a hole had been dug in the ground for support. A cross, as the cross slid into position, there's a sudden jolt as it hits bottom, creating an even greater surge of pain radiating through it throughout Jesus' body. For now the weight of his flesh tugged against the muscle and sinew and bones, which held him firmly in place by each nail. As midday approached, an unusual darkness fell over the whole land. Three, out, three long hours later, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uttering a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and with this, the veil of the temple, some 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and several inches thick, was torn in two from top to bottom as the earth shook. The centurion soldier witnessing this death exclaimed, Truly, this was the Son of God. It's this awesome display of love that God has lavished upon us that we embrace as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. Scripture tells us no one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. It's this expression of love that's so endearing that one cannot help but be drawn closer to our Heavenly Father. So who is a friend? Jesus said, you are my friend if you do what I command. Jesus answered this through his obedience to God as he denied himself even unto the death to fulfill the Father's will. It was here that this question came to mind. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Perhaps you remember Jesus was asked this question by an expert of the law. And he replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus cried out from the cross, Lord, forgive them, for they know what they do. No, not what they do. I believe both were on his mind. But surely, Jesus had contemplated the fear of being crucified. <coughs> Emphatically, the answer is no. For Scripture tells us there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has nothing to do with punishment. Or ha fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Likewise, we are called to become imitators of Christ, that our hearts be filled with love and confidence and assurance as we approach the Lord's table. For through the grace of God, we have been given hope through Christ's death and resurrection. It's for this reason it is important that we examine our motives and our hearts before we participate in this memorial. For Proverbs 27, 19 reminds us, as water reflects the face, so that the heart of reflects the man. Therefore, out of deep reverence, let us reaffirm our love for our Lord by casting off our old sinful nature and in like manner being obedient in all things through the hope we have been given, then offering our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing, that through the glory of the Lord we may be transformed into his same likeness. And may we rejoice in the Lord as we await Jesus' return and coming judgment of the world and righteousness and the people and his faithfulness. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
as we worship you in this manner this morning, let the glory of your presence rest upon us, we pray. That your name will be praised and glorified in all that we do and say. We ask in Jesus' name and according to your will. Amen. <coughs>
So uh, we want to look at a topic today. It's after a hymn that we sing. I was thinking right, I can hold on to that hymn in today. But um, we sing a hymn, Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And I want to talk to you about trusting and obeying. And in order to do that, we want to look in the book of Exodus. Exodus. The second chapter. Exodus chapter 2. Let's right at the beginning, starting with verse 1. Exodus chapter 2, starting with verse 1. reads like this, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered, and the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now when you look at that story, it's, a, it's a kind of a simple story. If you know what's happening, uh, they're looking at, at killing babies. And so she hid Moses for three months, and then when she couldn't hide him any longer, she came up with a plan to put him in the, in the river, and hopefully something would happen. And it was Moses' sister who was watching over him, who then came up with a thing, hey, Pharaoh's people found her. Do you need someone to nurse him? Yes, we do. Now, the whole story is simply this. How much trust Moses' mother had to come up with this plan to save her child? How much trust did she have in God that God would come up with a way to save him? Absolutely. And then look at the story. Absolutely. Look at it unfold and who's Moses? Just another man. Did he do anything important? Yes. Why did he do something important? He, like his mother, trusted God. Trusting God can get us beyond where we are in our lives today. Trusting God can get us things we can't even imagine in our lives today. I look back at my life, and I'm thinking, surely... This isn't me. This is not the plan that I had in place and the things that I was thinking that I would do with my life. But God. God had another plan. And if we're willing to go with God's plan, things would be much different. Look at your life. How much have you trusted God? How much have you put your trust in Him? that you could see where you are today. How many of you, if it didn't come to trusting God, would not be here today? But be somewhere else, doing something else. As we go through the Bible, we find all these great stories. Noah. We know the story of Noah, right? Noah did what? Built a boat. Built a boat where? Middle of a desert. In a land that what? Never rained. Never rained. Trust. God said, do this, and out of obedience, Noah's like, okay. Not only did he say okay, he did it. Not only did he do it, he did it 
at the loss of friends, at the loss of family, at the loss of... I mean, people came at lunchtime to sit and eat lunch and watch him build a boat and ridicule him and make fun of him. Noah just kept right on building because of his trust and obedience to God. Now, I wonder how those people who came and sat there and jeered and shouted at him and made fun of him felt when the first raindrop fell. I wonder how they felt when the water started to well up from the ground. wonder how they felt when they were back paddling or doggy paddling to stay afloat. But Noah and his family were saved because of the trust he put in God. Joshua fought a battle. What kind of battle? One that he never swung a sword, never threw a spear. Never... What did he do? He marched. He marched around city walls making noise, clanging pots and making noise, carrying torches and making noise, blowing trumpets. I mean, it was all just this plan. Whose plan? God's plan. Joshua did what? Trusted. Trusted God to do what God said he would do. And on that seventh day, we, we see what happened. What happened? The walls came tumbling down. Which way did they tumble down? Out. To show that it was God, not them, pushing in. Not a sword sung, swung, not a spear tossed, but yet the battle and victory was theirs. Trust and obedience. And when you read the story of Joshua fighting that battle, he did everything exactly like God said. He didn't say, well, marching around his walls once is enough. No, he did it exactly how God wanted him to do it. By trusting in God's word, by trusting God saying to him to do this, the victory was theirs. Abraham. Abraham. How much trust did it take for him? I mean, there's a lot of different stories we choose from, but Abraham was told to leave his homeland and go where? Where? The land he didn't know. Where? He didn't know. Did you see the conversation that Abraham had with God? Well, where am I going to go and what am I going to do and who am I going to do it with and what will we eat and what will we... No, he didn't see that conversation because it wasn't had. Who are you? Abraham, the next morning, got up and gathered all his people and his flocks and his hips, I guess, and left. How many of you have ever moved? How many of you decided to move Thursday and on Friday you left? How long did it take you to move? You had to plan it out. You had to get boxes to put stuff in. You had to, I mean, heaven forbid Tom and Liz ever move. <laughs> yeah. How long would it take you to box it all up? Well, it depends on what size truck you get. <laughs> <laughs> As far as some likes from pulling up. No. <laughs> but it, it takes planning and all the things. Yet here's this man, rich in life, with servants and handmaids and animals and children, and, and they up and go. To where? We don't know. We'll go to land unknown, but when we get there, God will let us know. Is that trusting? Not knowing and, and, and just going? And how did it work out for him? The father of many nations. We go through and we look at Daniel. Daniel, at the peril of his own life, trusted God more than people. And when they came up with the rule that you couldn't pray to anybody else but the king, Daniel still went to his upper room, threw open his shutters and face, and, and prayed. What happened to him? 
arrested. We know the punishment, throwing the lion's den. They devoured them. They ate them up. Well, no. No. Because of his trust and obedience in God, God was there to protect his servant. Love her. I mean, how many times have you been in a spot where you didn't know, and how many of you just totally abandoned and threw it up and let God have it? How many of you tried to do it yourself? We say that we trust God. I said it. I remember, I tell you about it all the time, when I walked an aisle, my brothers, my sisters, my dad with me, came to a front pew, sat there, then the minister came up to us and he said, do you believe that Jesus is Christ the living God? I do. Do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Basically what he was saying is, do you trust him to run the rest of your life? How many of you made that statement? That you believe Jesus Christ is the living God? Your Lord and your Savior? I mean, how many of you trust him to run the rest of your life? Think hard. Because with trust comes obey. If you trust, then you obey. And you don't do it your way, you do it His way. His plan. Look at all these other people, and he, they did it His way. We can go to Abraham, the one up the mountain with, with his son. We can go all the way up to the point where he's raising the knife God's way. Trusting and believing that God and something else in store. I don't know that we go there today. Most of us would do anything to give our kids anything. And everything. I'm not sure that we walk them to the point of death. And you can see the trust and obedience in Abraham in that story. When his son says, Father, where's... Where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? God will provide. He trusted God. He was obedient to it, knowing that God would do that. Look at Mary. What about Mary? When the angel comes and tells her that she's going to be pregnant with the Son of God, she trembled, she screamed, no way, and she ran away. We probably would. I mean, and God comes to you tonight and tells you you're going to have a child. What's your thought? I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old. Sarah thought that. Sarah might have thought that too, but yet there was. I mean, if God has a plan and we trust Him, who are we then to say no? Mary's response is just, Prime. May it be so, as you have said. May it be so, as you said. May your plan be fulfilled in me. Man, does she have any idea what that plan was? Any inkling what that meant at that point? Age of 12, Jesus stays behind the caravan, is teaching in the temple. Mary's trusting God and saying, well, he's got to do what he's got to do and he'll catch up and they kept on going. No. What was Mary in their response? Go back, search, and find him. And what a reminder. Didn't she get a reminder? See, at the beginning they said that you're going to have the Son of God. And while he was teaching, and they said, where have you been? He said, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? Stark reality. This is not our kid. It is. But it belongs to him. Now, how many of you think your kids belong to you? <laughs> how many of your kids truly belong to God? You're just the care. You're just the caretaker. We see that in Mary's story. She was just the caretaker to, to raise him up to be what he is, so that he can do what God had planned for him to do. 
I have three kids that I've raised up to do what God has planned for them to do. And He might send them far away or keep them close, but they're His. We understand that. That we're just the guardians. We, we were the foster parents. He's the real father. And so we are given that to take care of. I mean, my favorite character, Peter. Oh, Peter. Look at him. Look at all his life. How many of you see someone near the shoreline walking and jump out of the boat and try to walk to him? But Peter, being Peter, you know, the one who cut the ear off, the one who, not me, I'm not going to deny you, but that Peter jumped out of a boat, walked on water. As long as he trusted Jesus. And the moment he looked down and allowed fear in, what? He sank until Jesus was there to save him. I mean, trust got him out of that boat. Trust allowed him to walk on water. What does your trust in God do for you today? How many of you can walk on water? Just me. Only in the middle of winter. Only in the middle of winter. Ah, uh, ye of little trust. <laughs> How many of you can fight the battle of Jericho and win? How many of you walk your child to the mountaintop? How many of you build a boat in the middle of the desert? I mean, and just look at the stories. It was trust and obedience that made them do it. Because God said to do it. I'm telling you today, trust in the Bible is far beyond the trust we think we have today. If we really trusted, we could walk on water. We could tell a mountain to jump into the sea and it would obey us. We could do phenomenal things if we but trusted. We trust Him enough to give us eternity. Do we trust Him enough to claim eternity? There's a difference. Eternity is here to, to be had by all. And all you have to do is accept His Son. The beginning. How many of you are trustfully living the life that it now takes to finish what you felt? I mean, look at, your, look at yourself. Look at your life every day. Do I trust him enough to do whatever he says, how he says it, when he says it? Do I pick up tomorrow and move if he asks me to? Do I stay in this tough situation because that's where he put me and he needs me to make a difference here? Do I raise my kids the way I want or the way that he would have it? Do I treat people the way I want or the way that Jesus gave us the example to treat them? How do I live my life to show my trust and obedience in Him? Because to trust and obey is the only way to be happy in Jesus. You can't partially trust. You can't partially, I mean, how many of you partially walked an aisle to be baptized? How many of you were partially baptized? How many of you partially gave up your life? It's a complete thing, isn't it? I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How much do you trust God? Read these stories. They trusted Him with their life. If Noah doesn't build the boat, then what? He dies. He dies. If Daniel didn't trust and believe in God, what happens? He 
does. Go through the stories and look. Look at the difference that God makes in their lives because of that trust and obedience. And all those stories are there so that we can look at them, that we can remember them, that we can pull them in and we can say, okay, what about me? What is God asking you to do in your life? And He is. He's asking you to do something that you don't trust Him in. Because you're not doing it. You know, we talk about it all the time. I, I quote the scripture over and over and over. Go ye therefore in all the world teaching, preaching, and baptizing. How many of us are doing that? How many of us trust him enough to go? And he's not saying go to Africa, go to South America. He's saying go. Go where? To your family. He's saying go to your neighbor. He's saying go to your people at work. Go to the people you run into at the grocery store. Go to those that are around you. Go to those that he has supplied right there in your vicinity. Now some of you he might say go and he means go to New Hampshire. There's someone there that needs you. He might say go and you have to go to Oklahoma or Nebraska. Because they need to hear from you. Because you're going to make the difference in their lives, not anybody else. For some, he might say go, and he's meaning in Haiti or Africa or South America. What we find it. I'm comfortable right here. I'm comfortable in my home church. I'm comfortable in my job and the people I know. I'm comfortable here. Man, if I go out there, I may not know anybody. How will I supply for my family and needs of not knowing what's there? If I can even get a job, if I Did you read the verse that was on the screen? That the sparrow doesn't plant, reap, or even store up. And yet God takes care of them. And if God will take care of the sparrow, how much more will he take care of you? If you would but trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Do we trust? Because without trust there can't be obedience. Do you trust in what the Lord is telling you? Do you trust in where the Lord wants to lead you? You trust Him with your very life to do whatever it is that He's placing before you. Because if you do, then be obedient. Go. Do. I mean, look around you. <clears throat> Winter folks have gone home. We got one last hold on for the last minute couple. Who in another week or two be gone? Yeah. Look around you. What do you see? Empty chairs. Why are the chairs empty? <coughs> I wonder if it's because we're not going. I wonder if it's because we're not saying or asking or telling. Go ye therefore in all the world teaching, preaching, and baptizing. Go into all the world and make a difference. Go into all the world trusting and obeying me and I will take care of you. That's God's promise. That's God's word to us. Do you trust Him and is the actions of your life evidence Do you trust Him? Will you go? Will you speak? Will you ask? Will you say? Will you show Jesus in all ways? Through obedience in Him. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you've never given your life to Christ, and so you don't know what this trust and obey means, this trust and obedience, because 
and you're doing it all yourself. Maybe this morning you need to say, okay, I'm tired of making a mess of things. I'm tired of being... Maybe this morning I need to turn it over. I need to trust Him and be obedient in my walk. My first fact of obedience is to come and claim Him and be baptized into Him. So that I can be His so that He can take control. Or maybe this morning you're sitting here and you've, you've done that. You've taken the first steps of accepting as Lord and Savior and your first act of obedience and being baptized into Him. And maybe since that point you've been sitting there going, now what? Now go. You're here every week hearing the Word. You sing the songs. Do you believe the songs? Do you learn from the words in the songs? Do you believe that Jesus died for you so that you could have eternal life? And it's just for you and no one else. Or do you believe he died for all mankind? Mm -hmm. And if we believe he died for all mankind, then we have to trust and obey him and go. <coughs> so that all mankind can hear and know the same God and Lord that we know. So they can come and sit here with us and learn and worship and grow so that his kingdom can flourish. They talked about a minister's minister who died this week. You see it on the news? They're all talking about him. He's the one that took the podium next to Martin Luther King. Stood there, a white man amongst all the blacks, saying, He's right. God is for all mankind. He's the minister who, is, who has been in the White House with 11 different presidents. He's the minister who did all these things. They called him minister's minister, and at 92 years old, he passed away this week. What did the minister's minister's message have for everybody? Love. He said it in everything. Love. God for all, go for all. God for all, go for all. Meaning, God's for everybody, we need to be out forgiven. Whatever it takes. He was the first one to stand up like so Martin Luther King and proclaim unity. We need to be together. They're just as human as we are. You know? He's the minister that made those changes. I mean, he trusted and obeyed God to make a difference in people's lives. Not because of him, because of Christ that lived in him. What about you? Will you trust and obey enough? make a difference in other people's lives because of Him. Will you go? As we stand and as we sing, if you have a decision to make, if you have something to say to God, I mean, to say to them, that you're ready and willing to go. Let's stand and sing.
Father, we just pray that you'll go with us now, that you'll strengthen us, that you'll guide us, that you'll help us to go. That we can spread your, your word, that we can teach others of you, that, Father, your kingdom can grow. Father, just guide us, direct us to those who need us. We pray this in your Son's name.